It's hard to believe these true crime tales actually occurred or that people could be capable of perpetrating such crimes since they are so horrifying. However, all of these tales are in fact genuine. Real life can occasionally be much grimmer than fiction. Real life often involves murder, kidnapping, betrayal, torture, and death. Between 1984 and 1987, Robert Bardella, one of the most heinous serial killers in American history, committed adorant acts of sexual torture and murder in Kansas City, Missouri. In 1949, Bardella was created in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. Although Robert's family was Catholic, he abandoned the religion when he was a teenager. When he passed away from a heart attack, his father was 39 years old. Age 16, she was Bordella. His mother soon after got remarried. In regards to his mother and stepfather, Bordella made no effort to conceal his rage and bitterness. Bordella chose to pursue a career in academia in 1967 and enrolled at the Kansas City Art Institute. He made the quick decision to shift careers and began culinary school. His ideas of torture and murder started to fester around this time. For a little while, he found some solace in harassing animals. He started dealing drugs and binge drinking when he was 19 years old. Although he was detained for having LSD and marijuana, the accusations against him were dropped. After killing a dog for the purpose of art in his second year of college, he was asked to leave. He worked as a cook for a while after that, but eventually left the position and started Bob's Bazaar Bazaar in Kansas City, Missouri. The shop specialized in novelty goods that were popular with customers who had a darker, occult style of taste. He was regarded as unusual in the community, but he was liked and took part in setting up a local community crime watch program. It was found that Robert Bob Bardella lived in a world where brutal torture, murder, and sadomasochistic servitude were the norm. A neighbor discovered a young man on his porch on April 2, 1988, wearing nothing but a dog collar around his neck. The victim described to his next-door neighbor how Bardella had subjected him to severe sexual assault. After arresting Bardella, the police investigated his house and found 357 images of torture victims in various poses. In Bardella's yard, there were also torture tools, occult books, ceremonial robes, human skulls and bones, and a human head. By April 4th, the prosecution had amassed sufficient evidence to bring seven sodomy counts, one case of felony restraint, and one count of first-degree assault against Berdella. Six of the 23 identified guys were homicide victims, as revealed after closer examination of the images. The other individuals in the images were present on their own violation and engaged in a sadomasochistic acts alongside the victims. The rules of the house, which Berdella imposed on his victims, had to be followed in order to prevent beatings or electric shocks to delicate body parts. Berdella kept a thorough journal in which he recorded the specifics and results of the torture he would subject his victims to. He seemed to find it fascinating to inject narcotics, bleach, and other caustics into his victims' eyes and throats, followed by anal rape or the insertion of foreign items. On December 19, 1988, Berdella pleaded guilty to four more counts of second-degree murder that involved the deaths of additional victims in addition to a charge of first-degree murder. In response, the investigators stated that over 550 people were questioned and that there was never any evidence linking the crimes to satanic practices or organizations. Various media outlets attempted to link the crimes of Bardella to the idea of a national underground satanic group. Bardella was given a life sentence in jail where he suffered a heart attack and passed away in 1992, not long after complaining in a letter to his minister that the guards had withheld his heart medicine. His demise was never looked into. On January 20, 2008, 19-year-old Brianna Dennison and her friends went to a party. She returned to her friend's home to spend the night after the party. The females could readily enter the house because the door was never locked. While her friends went upstairs to sleep, Brianna started making her bed for the night on the couch. At 4.23 a.m., while texting her boyfriend, she was last seen by her friends. 
The next morning, when her friends went downstairs, she couldn't find Brianna. She was initially unconcerned because she believed Brianna had left without saying goodbye. Her shoes, clothes, and phone, however, were still in the house. The pillow Brianna was using had a disturbing brown blood stain on it as well. Her friend called Brianna's mother right away to let her know what she had seen, and then she called the police. When officers arrived at the residence, they discovered touch DNA from an unidentified male on the front doorknob. The DNA was connected to two previous local sexual assaults. When Brianna's blood was confirmed as the mark on the pillow, everyone's worst nightmare came true. The police started concentrating on a kidnapping scenario. Reno police searched everywhere but couldn't find Brianna despite help from the FBI. On February 15, 2008, a man coming back from lunch discovered a pair of bright orange socks sticking out of a ditch full of fallen tree limbs. He realized it was the body of a young woman as he drew nearer. With the exception of the eye-catching orange socks, she was completely naked. Brianna Dennison was identified as the victim when police came to conduct an investigation. She had two pairs of panties under her right knee and prominent ligature marks on her neck, which indicated that she had been strangled to death with a woman's thong. The results of an autopsy further supported Brianna's rape. Later, it was discovered that one pair of pants belonged to Brianna's acquaintance, who claimed she was unaware that they were missing. DNA from the unidentified female was present on the final pair. To learn more about their encounters with the rapist, police spoke with the two victims who had been subjected to attacks by the same mysterious person before Brianna was killed. They claimed that following the attack, the man insisted on removing their pants as a memento. A composite sketch was created and made public thanks to the woman's accurate descriptions of the man and his truck. On November 1st, 2008, a woman provided an anonymous tip claiming that her friend had told her about seeing strange knickers in her boyfriend's van. She claimed that James Bila, the boyfriend of her friend, appeared uncannily identical to the composite sketch of the man's face and truck. Police questioned Biela six days later and requested a DNA sample, which he declined. By asking his fiance if they might swab the mouth of Biela's little boy, investigators tried a second strategy for obtaining his DNA. She didn't think twice before agreeing. The young boy's DNA confirmed that he was linked to Brianna's killer, as was to be expected. James Bila was formally detained on November 25, 2008 for the rape and murder of Brianna as well as the earlier attacks. He was found guilty on two charges of sexual assault, as well as first-degree murder, kidnapping, and assault with a dangerous weapon. Bila received the death sentence along with four life sentences. Michelle Blair, 35 years old, was living with four children in 2015. She lost her lease on her apartment. She was unable to maintain consistent employment after being evicted and was constantly requesting financial assistance from her family. However, the calls ceased when they advised her to find employment and return to school. She apparently disregarded their counsel because she received an eviction notice on the morning of March 24, 2015. She wasn't there though. At that point, a team from the 36th District Court entered the house and started taking furniture out. When they opened the deep freezer, they discovered something that nobody should ever have witnessed. Under a teenage girl, they discovered the body of a younger boy who had been wrapped in a large plastic bag. She was detained. When the cops carried her away, she allegedly said, I'm sorry. Authorities moved the bodies to a mortuary in the interim so an autopsy could be done. Her children, Stephen Berry and Stoney Blair, were recognized as the kids. Their deaths were judged homicides by the medical examiner, who also established that they had been in the freezer for at least three years. She admitted to the judge, I would kill them again. In court, Michelle Blair admitted to the killings in Wayne County. She claimed to have murdered her demons after learning that they were raping her youngest son, although this claim was never been proven. Blair claimed that when she got home one day in August 2012, her kids were playing with dolls to simulate sex. Blair then questioned him, Why are you acting that way? Have you ever experienced this? She admitted to the judge in court that she had no regrets about what she had done. She was heard telling the judge, I would kill them again. Blair claimed she discovered her daughter, Stoney, was also raping her younger son nine months after killing Stephen. 
She then started starving Stoney and torturing her viciously until she passed away in May 2013. She claimed that she was planning to turn herself in to the police, but changed her mind after hearing from her youngest son that he didn't want her to go. Stoney's body was placed in a plastic bag and placed on top of Stephen in the deep freezer. Blair then went about her daily business as usual inside the house. Nobody sought out Stephen and Stoney during the nearly three years they spent in the deep freezer. Blair had already pulled them out of school because their fathers were not present. She announced to school officials that she would be teaching them at home. She always had an explanation when neighbors inquired about the location of the kids. At the Huron Valley Correctional Facility in Ypsilanti, Michigan, Michelle Blair is currently serving a life sentence after entering a guilty plea to two charges of first-degree premeditated murder in June 2015. That's it for today's video. What would you do if such a person was nearby? In the comment area, share your opinion. Regards for tuning in.